just in case you're thinking I was a secret cigarette smoker or I'd had a, a joint before I came, um, <laughs> there, there is a reason why a box of matches was in my pocket, which young Gay helped to wriggle loose. Um, so you'll, you'll see how that fits in later. Um, it might be easier. Excuse me, Woody and Sophia, with Angela. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. If I move around a bit. So this theme of the throne of God, we looked at where is the throne of God, and the scriptures talk about heaven is God's throne. And that might sound like a bit weird, but in all honesty, it's, it declares how huge, how massive, majestic, almighty, eternal God is. What can you compare, you know, God to? It's impossible, but heaven is his throne. We then looked at the theme of, well, who is on the throne? And realizing that the, the terms God and Lord are just titles, but the one who sits on the throne does have a name. And it's in that, the Hebrew letters of that, that yod heh vav -he, which is, I hope I get this right, um, in an acceptably agreeable way, uh, Yahovah. Um, some controversy exists over the pronunciation of the sacred name of God. Some refer to it in different ways, Yahweh. Um, but if we take just the way the scriptures talk about it, Jehovah or Yahweh, uh, it's probably very um, acceptable. We then looked at, if God is on the throne, how come the world is such a mess? And we looked at the journey of how God originally intended the world to be super duper, but sin came into the world and proverbially mucked it up. We then looked at, uh, last time, this idea of if God is on the throne, how does he exercise his authority? And we looked at, you know, how he did things in the days of Noah and how he did things through the Exodus. And he can work individually, but he can also work nationally, and he can work globally. Uh, don't mess with him. You know, I mean, that's not the whole story, but, you know, it was to show that God on the throne is very active in the world at a personal, um, national, and international, global level. Today's one, though, is looking at how can we approach such a God who, whose throne is in heaven. And it's a biggie. So I'd like us to open up our... Bible apps or Bibles, whichever you prefer, and we're just going to journey into the first mention of the throne of God to start us off, because it's a very interesting passage. Um, historically, Israel enters into the land of Canaan and settles in that land, but it's not long before different kings come and go, and relationships with God start to deteriorate and eventually there's a split in the nation of Israel and there's the northern tribes and there's the southern tribes and all this sort of stuff goes on. So we're taking up the story of a, that takes place around about this time, 800 to 900 years before Messiah is born. And we're dealing with a king called Jehoshaphat he is the king of Judah at that time, the southern tribe. But we're also dealing with a bit of a challenging character called King Ahab, who is the king of Israel in the north. <coughs> he wasn't always a ratbag old Ahab. He did repent in the days of Elijah, and, you know, he had his... But basically, he had major problems. And anyway, what's happened is... Because if you're like me, all that just goes in one ear and out the other. This is a, a, like a schematic map here of Israel. There's the Mediterranean Sea. And you'll see that the kingdom has been split. There's the southern kingdom called Judah, 
And then there's the northern ten tribes, which was called collectively Israel. And you'll notice that our story picks up on this territory at a place, place called Ramoth Gilead, which used to belong to Israel. But these guys from Syria had come in and conquered it. Okay, so that's the context. You think, well, what, what on earth has that got to do with the throne of God? Well, let's have a little look. First Kings. So, it's not a book we often go to. First Kings chapter 22. And we're going to pick it up at verse 10. And what's fascinating is the play on words. So, what, what's kind of happened is this guy, King Jehoshaphat, has trot, trot, trotted his way along in a chariot to meet up with King Ahab, and they're over in <coughs> Samaria, and they're going to have a chat about a war plan to go and beat the daylights out of these guys and reclaim the territory. This is where how it picks up. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat the king sat each on his throne, having put on their robes in a void place in the entrance of the gate of Samaria. So I want you to try and imagine the two kings gathered in Samaria there they put on all these gorgeous robes, you know, all made up, you know, as kings would have done in those days, with all their pomp, and they've got a fancy little throne to sit on. And they ask, well, King Ahab asks all the, his prophets, several hundred of them, should I go up and beat the daylights out of these guys in Ram of Gilead? And all the prophets go, yeah, yeah, go for it, smash them up, you know. And then Jehoshaphat, the king from this territory, who's sitting there in his regalia on the throne, he says, well, hang on a minute. Isn't there another prophet around somewhere who can sort of, uh, a prophet of Yahweh or Yahovah, uh, that we can uh, check out what he has to say? Mm -hmm. Because all these other prophets, they were dodgy prophets. And... So Jehoshaphat asks, and Ahab replies, and he says, well, there is one guy, but I hate his guts. His name was Micaiah. Micaiah. And Micaiah um, is very, very interesting. He's like on his own as a prophet, but he's a true prophet. He's the real McCoy. And in those days, if you wanted to find out and approach the throne of God, that was one way that you could do it through a real prophet and ask the prophet to seek God and God would respond through the prophet to you. Well, the drama builds. So, now the prophets, false prophets say go and beat the daylights out of him. Now, Micaiah, his name in Hebrew means who is like Yah. And again, it's like a wonderful play on words that he is this real prophet and his, mean, his name means this, no, who else is like the true God? There's no one. And he is invited to speak. So let's pick up what he says in verse 19. Okay. And he said to the two pompous kings on their thrones, Hear you therefore the word of the Lord, or Yahovah. I saw Yahovah sitting on his throne. Just pick up on that. Micaiah is standing before these two dudes on their thrones. And he says, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne. Gorgeous contrast. You see, the prophets had a connection with God on the throne in those days. The true ones did. 
And they often had a jolly hard time because the world hated them, the people hated them. So it wasn't a cushy job at all. It was a, a real challenging role to, to have. And he says, I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall, in other words, die, at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and another said on this manner, and there came forth a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I'll persuade him. And the Lord said to him, there, yeah, how will you do that? I will go forth and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all Ahab's prophets. And he said, you shall persuade him and prevail also. Go forth and do so. It's an incredible thing. And so the story goes that, he heads off to battle, and even though, um, you know, it, it, it's an incredible contrast, and he, he was warned that he would fall. He was warned that the uh, uh, prophets of his bunch were rat bags, they were liars. And yet, Ahab still disobeys the warning from Micaiah and believes the false dodgy prophets. And the story goes that he gets an arrow in his guts and bleeds to death and dies. So it's not a very nice message so far, is it? Um, a bit of blood and guts. But the point is this, is that in those days, if you wanted to approach the throne of God, you needed someone to go through. It's very difficult to approach such a, an amazing holy God on your own. God allowed certain people called prophets to approach and they could find out what God wanted or what God's thoughts were on a matter. Okay. At the end of the day, Ahab, <coughs> like people today, have a choice. They can either, either respond to what God says and take heed of it, or they can ignore it. So, that's one of the little applications. Alright. Okay. So that was the first mention of the throne of God. So, this theme of how do we approach the throne of God has been, way back then, and continues to 2021, to be a very challenging issue. This religious group will say, you approach God this way. This religious group will say, you've got to do this, and this, and this. Someone else will say, nah, you're all wrong, you've got to do that. How on earth do we know the right way to go? To approach God. Come on, you, you know you've experienced this, eh? It, it does your head in, let alone your heart. How do I know what to do? Some of the biggest religious organizations in the world have convinced millions that this is a certain way that you need to go. But I'll be honest with you, I don't think that their way is well supported <coughs> in the scriptures. We've got to be very discerning. There were 400 prophets who were saying, go this way, go this way. And only one little prophet called Micaiah who said, you go that way, you're going to get the chop. <laughs> and Ahab followed the majority. Yeah. Didn't listen to the little old Micaiah. <laughs> this is the challenge that's before us as we journey into this teaching. How on earth do we approach the throne of God knowing that it's the right way, that it's the safe way, that it's His way and not our way? All right, just here we go. So another way that God revealed how people could approach him was 
he recognised people couldn't come up to him because his throne is in heaven and he's eternal and we're little mortals. They didn't have Elon Musk spaceships in those days or satellites to zoom off and play around in the sort of outer space. But even if they did, that wouldn't have got them to God's throne anyway. So what happened is that God actually came down to earth and dwelt among the people of Israel so that they could approach him in that way. So how on earth did that work? God comes down to earth so that people can approach him and kind of get to know him a bit. So we need to just think for a moment about this thing called the tabernacle. The tabernacle was fenced off with uh, posts and curtains. It had a fancy doorway and only one entrance way in and only certain people could go in. They were the uh, priests and the first thing that they were met with on their journey towards God who presenced himself in this sort of glorious way above a certain uh, bit of furniture was through this way. The first thing, as you, if you were a priest, if you were journeying towards God, the first thing you hit was a doorway, and it was closed. But if you're the right person, you could go in, and the next thing you were hit with was an altar. You were confronted with your sinfulness and your need for a sacrifice. If you wanted to journey a bit closer, like if you had roster to go in and light the candles on the candlestick or do the showbread or burn some incense on the golden altar, the next thing you were confronted with was your daily need for sanctification, the laver. You couldn't go in there without washing your hands and you know cleaning yourself up a bit. The next thing you were confronted with was another door. You couldn't just come in this door and go, yeah, I can see God. I can yeah, there was no way. And then you would wend your way in and you were confronted with a third barrier, a third barrier, this veil. Nobody could go through that veil except one person and only once a year. That's how God introduced the idea to mankind of how they could approach him. I'm using basic language because it, it's a good entry point just to realize how challenging it was to approach God. Think about it. Ordinary people, not a show. Now I want you just to think about someone called the Messiah or Jesus or Yeshua. He said, I'm the door. He also was declared to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And there's something very special at the end of this teaching about how he did something down this end so that we could come into the presence of God on the throne. But that's yet to come. Alright? So just recapping quickly. God's presence comes into the, was called the holiest place. This is why it was so tricky. God is not a man. He's not like a human. He is so above us. He's so almighty and holy. We must right size God. We've got to realize that if we're going to approach God, it's got to be on his grounds. So, he met on what was called the mercy seat on the gold, above the Ark of the Covenant, in which was the Ten Commandments. And he met there based on the, the, the foundation of those commands of holiness. Very briefly, these things. The curtain, entranceway. Barrier number one. There it is. Barrier number two. The brazen altar of sacrifice. 
Area number three, the laver, the priestly washing. Barrier number four, second doorway, the door to the tabernacle proper. And then we've got some bits and pieces inside the tabernacle proper, but we've got this last one, the veil, before coming into the presence of God. Now, that is a formidable challenge to you and I today. If, if that was the way that God wanted us to approach him, how on earth could we qualify to come into the presence of this holy God? There's no way. I couldn't do it. You couldn't do it. Even if you were a high priest in those old days, you could only go in one once a year on the Day of Atonement, and not without blood, you have to sprinkle it upon the mercy seat. We've got a big problem, haven't we? How are we going to approach God? Have you got a, a lamb to offer for your sin? Have you got a, a heifer or a goat to offer for your sin? The blood of bulls and goats <coughs> could never fully remove sin forever. No matter how much farmland you are responsible for, no matter how many truckloads of cattle and sheep you might offer, it would never be enough. How on earth do humans, let Gentile people like you and I, let alone Israel people, how do we approach God? today. Well, it's a wonderful good news story because fortunately this way is no longer required. Just bear that in mind. This way that was revealed to the children of Israel is no longer required. If it was, we'd be in a pickle. This chap here could only go in once a year and not without blood. He was called the high priest. What's exciting, people, is that there is an, another way that we can approach God. There's another doorway. There's another sacrifice. There's another great high priest, not just a high priest, but a great high priest. I wonder who it is. How did he do it? Well, anyway, whew, just, there's our challenge. Look, all the way in. Now, just in case you thought that in those days it was easy and that God was pretty lax, there's an amazing story I want to now turn us to. And it's a story of two characters. These two characters are found in Leviticus chapter 10. <coughs> so, open up our Bibles, please. Leviticus chapter 10. So this is pretty early on, when the tabernacle was being set up. You might remember that Moses had a brother called Aaron. And Aaron had four kids. And the two oldest kids were called Nadab and Abihu. Now, what happens is very sobering. Let's look at verses 1 to 4. I'd love someone to read that for us, please. Leviticus 10, 1 to 4. Then Nahab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, each took his censer and put fire in it, put incense on it, and offered profane fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. So fire went out from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. 
And Moses said to Aaron, This is what the Lord spoke, saying, By those who come near me, I must be regarded as holy, and before all the people, I must be glorified. Mm. So Aaron held his peace. Well, just uh, pause it there. Thank okay. you, Rachel. That was gorgeous. So, Nadab and Abihu are the oldest children of Aaron. Aaron's the high priest. He's the first high priest. And these two guys missed, made a major error. They thought coming into the presence of God, hey, we don't have to do it God's way. We can, um, you know, offer incense our own way. I was really hoping that David and Angela don't have a, a little smoke alarm above me. <laughs> and they thought, we don't have to get the, 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 the uh, coals from off the sacrifice, the, the brazen altar of sacrifice that had been sanctified by the offerings. They thought, oh, we can just make our own fire and our own censer. We don't have to do it God's way. We'll do it our way. And so they thought... We're going to light up a bit of a censer and smoke it and go into the sanctuary our way. Now, isn't that an illustration of the world today? God has declared in his word that there's a certain way to approach him. He's an infinitely holy God. Mankind thinks, no, I can do it my way. I'll smoke it. Nice as it might be, like Cain, you know, brought in some offerings from the veggie patch out in the field, but he didn't realize that sin had to be redeemed by a blood sacrifice. Sin is so serious, veggies from the garden won't atone for sin. And Nadab and Abihu made that same fatal mistake. Maybe Abihu didn't have a match. Maybe he had some sort of a a newfangled gas sensor. And he thought, oh, I'll try this method. But the thing is, both methods were dodgy. They bypassed the need for the coals off the brazen altar. They didn't realize the holiness of God, the majesty of God. They had this little human view of God. And they mucked up big time. Even though they were priests, even though they were the next in line to be the high priest once Aaron had died, they made a major muck-up. And that's a sobering reminder for us today. What is the way that we are risking our life to approach God? That what, is, what, is we, what are we willing to, to die for? You know, when you get to an old age and you die, what are you willing to risk in terms of the way that you think you can approach God? Because if you get it right, you get through. If you get it wrong, it's going to be very, very tragic. Jesus warned with these words. He said, narrow is the way which lead to life, and few there be that find it. He said, broad is the way. And wide is the gate that leads to destruction. And many that go in thereat. It's a battle. It's a challenge. There's a battle for the mind. A battle for the heart. Your allegiance. Your devotion. We've got to make sure we get it right. So these two guys. It's very sobering. The word strange, fire, the word Hebrew word for strange means unauthorized, foreign or profane. God not only rejected their sacrifice, he found it offensive and they were taken out. Just look at the picture. Something might start to happen as you look at it. It's an incredibly sobering thought that these two guys didn't take heed to the warning of the Word of God. 
That's why we go out with the gospel each Saturday where we, when we can. Can't go out today because of the weather. We've got to try and warn people. We've got to try and share the love of God, the good news, which is incredibly amazing. We mustn't keep it to ourselves because others don't realize the peril that they're in. So, a, a little less intense now, just for a moment. Third story. So we've had Micaiah. We've had the idea of the, the, the tabernacle and Nadab and Abihu. Just want us to get a breather. Want us to go to a place in Israel called Mount Carmel. Now Mount Carmel is a mountain range in the northernish part of Israel. And if you look eastward, it looks across gorgeous, fertile plains. And over beyond these little hills here would be the Sea of Galilee. Remember where Jesus hung out with his disciples? Beautiful, fertile territory. Anyone ever been to Israel? Well, that's what you'd see if you climbed up on the eastern side. If you imagine a map here, you've got this mountain range here, just near the coast of the Mediterranean Sea. And we're looking across that way towards these mountains little hills which are just obscuring the Sea of Galilee. Okay. A little bit chance just to promote. If we went to the other side of Mount Carmel, looking out to the sea of the Mediterranean Sea, this is what it would look like. This is called the modern day city of Haifa. And there is the huge port. It's one of the major ports in Israel. And they do all their trade and shipping and coming and goings with all those European countries around the Mediterranean Sea. And this is the western flank of Mount Carmel. Now something special happens in the Bible regarding Mount Carmel. And it's got everything to do with approaching God. And it involves this character called, it's just a drawing, mm -hmm. but it's a character in the Bible called Elijah. And a bit like Micaiah, his name is very special. Eli, you remember Jesus said, Eli, Eli, my God or my Lord, you know, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eli means my God and mm -hmm. Yah, Elijah, means my God is Yah. That's what Elijah means. And in his day, there were these dodgy people who worshipped this false god called Baal. And they had idols, and they would bow down. I mean, I've been teaching on the Thai Burmese border for s seven years. And as you go through Thailand to the Thai Burmese border, you see Buddhist temples. And I've visited the, some of them just to look in. And it's sobering, there's enormous big idols covered in gold. And the people are sincere. They're probably, I'll be brutally blunt, they're probably more passionate about their God than you and I. They're on their knees with their incense, spending a lot of time passionately offering this stuff to this idol. And it's the most saddening Thing imaginable. And in Elijah's day, this is what they did too. They offered even their little children, sorry to get a bit brutal, but they offered their little kids to the, these false gods, sacrificed them. And Elijah was up against this. These, the majority were saying, hey, the way to God is through this idol and through this other stuff. And Elijah said, no way, guys. So they had a showdown on Mount Carmel. And Elijah gives them an ultimatum. He says this, How long will you halt between two opinions? If Yahovah is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the God who answers by fire will be the true God. So they make this altar. They do all the stuff and the false prophets of Baal, they cut themselves and sprinkle their blood on it and Yahoo around it all day. Mm -hmm. Nothing. 
and screaming and yelling and carrying on and nothing. Absolutely silence from heaven. Elijah comes along. Okay, guys, move aside. He pours all this water, water upon water, to make it absolutely impossible for fire to spring out of it by some sort of a chance thing. And then he prays and he says, Let you know, God reveal yourself. And no kidding. This incredible blazing lightning bolt of fire just comes down of heaven. Not only consumes the sacrifice on the altar, but licks up all the water and everything around it. And as a result, the people are convinced in that moment who the true God is and how they are to approach God. It's not by the idols. It's not by cutting themselves. It's through an acceptable sacrifice on an altar that is acceptable to him. It's an amazing story. There's a lot more to it. I think it's just the details. The yeah. fire of the Lord fell. When all the people saw it, they didn't grab guitars and start yahooing. They fell on their faces because that's what real worship is about. That's what real worship is, taking the lowest place, acknowledging the almightiness and holiness of who it is that you're worshipping. You just get down on your face because, quite frankly, you're in awe and ashamed and, you know, humbled. And they said, the Lord, or Yahweh, is, he is God. So, just breathe, just take a couple of breaths for a moment. It's all very well, Alistair, we've had Micaiah, the tabernacle, Nadab and Abihu, and Elijah. What on earth has that got to do with us here in Tarama, in Aotearoa? What's it got to do with little Gabe? What's it got to do with us, people that we know in our families? Well, it's a very sobering foundation for understanding the gospel. Because when God sends his beloved son, Yeshua, the Lord Jesus, into the world, he perfectly fulfills everything that God requires so that you and I and Gabe and everybody else can come to him through repentance and faith and be assured of being able to approach God. Not just approach him, but live with him forever. You go, hey, how on earth was that achieved? That's, that's a big mouthful. Well, here it is. It's an old problem. It's incredibly relevant for us today. How are we going to do it? I, I'm not tr trying to be derogatory or nasty towards any religions, but I'm just trying to be brutally frank. If Is Islam the way? Is Buddhism the way? Is Hinduism the way? Is the Hare Krishnas the way? Is, you know... It, it goes on and on. You know, it, are pagan religions the way? Um, is a atheism going to get us there? Is going to the gym every day going to get us there? Uh, is it the sacraments or is it some other thing we have to do? What is it? What is it? What is it? Do you know? Yes. What do we have to do? Have to do. So here it is. Look closely. This is a sketch of inside the temple of what it might have looked like at the time of Jesus. There's some of the religious people. And let's imagine that they are in that holy place. 
and there's this veil. So these priests have kind of come in, and there's this huge veil that is separating them from the holiest of all. And they knew they couldn't go in unless you were the high priest once a year. But something has been happening in their community. This person, Yeshua, the Messiah, claimed to be the son of David and the son of God, was rejected and condemned to death. And they led him up to a hill called Calvary. And they bashed some nails into his arms and bashed some nails into his jolly feet. And they stuck a crown of thorns on his head, lifted him up, mocked him, and he bled to death over six hours. Something was going on in that community of Jerusalem. And what happened is when he died, when this person died, something profound happened in that holiest of all in the temple of Jerusalem. Watch closely what happens. Because what we're talking about is not the old way anymore. It's not our way, what we might think, like Nadab and Abihu, it's God's way declared in the scriptures. And this way is very different. This person who died on the cross fulfilled everything that was required. And when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It says in scripture, he yielded up the ghost, he died. And something happened. It says the veil in the temple was ripped from the top to the bottom. And look at that. Bang. Just a bit of sound effects with the keyboard, Julia. <laughs> just see that again. When he died, it wasn't just the material of that cloth that was being ripped apart. It was the barrier for mankind to come into the presence of God was blazed open. That's the, that's the real message. It's not just about a bit of cloth that was ripped. It's the message that the way to God was no longer restricted to one dude once a year on the Day of Atonement and not without blood. Something special happened at that moment in terms of our ability to approach the living God. And this is what the scriptures say. Now where remission of these is, that remission means to take away sin. There is no more offering for sin. There's no need for us to bring a lamb or some turtle doves or a goat or a heifer. No need to go down to countdown and grab something and offer it on an, out, on an altar. There's no need. There's no need for any other sacrifice. Having therefore, brothers, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. The blood of Jesus does what the sacrifices could never do. The blood of Jesus, because he was holy, without sin, the Son of God, perfectly covers every single sin that we've ever thought, done, might do. It's incredible. And the way is open. And that's what the scriptures say. It says, by a new and living way. Not the old way, not our own way but a new and living way. That's how the Bible in the New Testament describes we can approach God. New, but it's a living way because Jesus is now alive and he'll live forever and he's there at the right hand of God able to do whatever's needed to make sure we get from this world into the next. Isn't that incredible? And it says, because we have this high priest over the house of God, let us draw near. We've got that invitation. Not like the 
Israelites that were camped around the tabernacle and only the priests could come in. Let us, let all of us who have Jesus as their saviour, we can, we're invited, we're welcome to actually come into the presence of God. Isn't that stunning? <coughs> it's so amazing. We have such a high priest who is set at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, and the true tabernacle, which Yahovah pitched, and not man. This is a new and living way. Not because I deserve it, or you deserve it, not because we worked it out. No, God worked it out. He fulfilled all that he required to totally meet his holiness, so that we could be sanctified and consecrated and coming to him, not like Nadab and Abihu. So, to wrap it up, this is the final thought. Would somebody read that for us, please? Seeing then that we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. Yeah, that's our, like our faith. Hold on to that. We've got not 